Hello, I'm Glenn Hall, and this is part two of a new series that I'm doing called A Seamless Garment. This particular teaching is called Who is the Ruler of This World? I expect that this series is going to take quite a long time, several months, I would think, at least. I am considering writing a book uh, based upon the things that the Lord has shown me over the last year. I have 300-page notebooks that are filled with new understanding, new revelations from the Word of God. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to give you a pretty elementary teaching, but it's important that we have the foundation of our faith very firmly fixed before we go on with the things that I'm going to be saying. And that's because most of you, when you hear what I have to say, are going to be inclined not to believe it. So we need to have a very strong grasp of the Word of God. And that's why I'm calling this series A Seamless Garment. The Word of God is not to be added to or subtracted from. I take my responsibility as a teacher very seriously. I do not intend to tell you what I think. I intend to tell you what I believe God thinks, what I believe God says. <clears throat> Like Jesus, I want to be found only doing what my Father would have me do. And so today, we're going to discuss the ruler of this world. Who is the ruler of this world? I think most people would be inclined to say God or Jesus Christ. And that's a good answer in that, ultimately, they rule all things. That our God rules all things. But let's go to Scripture and see who the ruler of the world is. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says this, We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now the question, of course, is who is the evil one? Matthew thirteen nineteen says this, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Then in Matthew thirteen thirty eight, Jesus said, The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. In John chapter 17, verse 15, Jesus said, as he was praying, I do not ask that you take them, that is his disciples, out of the world, but I pray that you keep them from the evil one. In Ephesians Chapter 6, verse 16, Paul said, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3 says, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. John, writing in 1 John chapter 2, verse 13, says, I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. Then going on into verse 14, he says, I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome 
the evil one. Then in chapter 3, verse 12, John says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. <clears throat> then in 1 John chapter 5, 18, John says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. And then reading 19 again, We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. In the book of John itself, in chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus says this, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Now some might take that verse and say, well, since Jesus said the ruler of this world will be cast out, obviously he was cast out then when Jesus was crucified and when he, was, when he rose from the dead. Something did happen then spiritually, but yet the evil one's domain was not taken from him at that time. So where was he cast out from? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 say this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now see, Paul wrote after Jesus died and was resurrected, <clears throat> And here, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he is calling this person the God of this world. This God who is the God of this world, this evil one, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You know, a whole... Teaching could easily come out of that one or these two verses, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. We need to see that the God of this world, his goal is to blind minds. His goal is to keep people from seeing the light of the gospel. Now, many of you will remember the temptation of Jesus, and I'll read some of the verses dealing with that. In Matthew chapter 4, starting with verse four, uh, 1, or two, 1, yes. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Notice that the devil knows the scripture very well. So then Jesus answers him, again using scripture, and says, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now this particular passage, this whole temptation of Satan, is reiterated by Luke in his 
gospel. And in Luke chapter 4, I want to read the second temptation. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you, to you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. See, Satan very clearly here said that the authority of this world, this earth, this place that we call our world, that the authority over the kingdoms of this world had been given to him. Jesus did not dispute that fact at all. He didn't say, oh, Satan, you're mistaken. The authority has been given to me. He didn't say that. Now we'll look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And then in Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10, Paul begins to teach us how to pray. And he says these things, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So what we're seeing is that the evil one is called the devil. We also see that he is the prince of the power of the air. We see that he is the ruler of this world. But do we understand who he is? You know, in my long journey as a Christian, I've come across quite a few people who will try to say that um, Satan is just a concept or an idea, and some people call Satan my stinking thinking, you know, the way that you think, your, your sinful thoughts and things like that. But let's go to Jude chapter, well, there's only one chapter, verse 8. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defiled the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. <clears throat> Interesting, isn't it, that Jude calls the devil a glorious one. That the archangel Michael, considered to be the greatest, perhaps the greatest angel of all, did not pronounce a judgment against the devil but said, the Lord rebuke you. He went to a higher authority than himself. Now let's go to the book of Revelation. Chapter 
they have as king over them. This is verse 11, Revelation 9, verse 11. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. Okay, the bottomless pit, the actual word for that is abyss. A-B-Y-S-S, the abyss or the deep, the bottomless pit. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. Now, interestingly, the abyss is what we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. This is something we see at the very beginning of the account of creation. Verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But verse 2 says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. That's the abyss. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. I believe that what we have in view here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, is a destroyed world, a destroyed creation. And the one who is responsible for that destruction is the destroyer of Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, whose name is Abaddon or Apollyon, the destroyer. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Ah, finally, we come to that name, Satan. Satan now is equated with the devil. And not only the devil, but the great dragon. Verse 9 again. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent. That ancient serpent. Okay, now that equates him with the serpent of Genesis chapter 3. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Satan is the deceiver of the whole world. Jesus calls him a liar and the father of lies. Why do you think Satan is always lying? Just hold that thought because I do not intend to tell you in this video today. He, Satan, was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him. They have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Is Revelation 12, 7, is that telling us what Jesus meant back in the book of John when he said that now the ruler of this world will be cast out John 12, 31. 
Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Was he thrown to earth when Jesus took the keys from him when he was resurrected? And does Revelation 12, verse 7 speak, 7 through 12 speak of that time? Well, in Revelation 12, verse 9, we see, and this is very important to know and understand and to remember, the great dragon is the ancient serpent. He is also called the devil, and he's also called Satan. So we have the great dragon, the ancient serpent, called the devil, called Satan, called the deceiver of the whole world. He's a liar. He's the father of lies, Jesus says. John reveals who Satan is, that he is actually the serpent seen in the very beginning of the book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says this, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now we know from Revelation 12 that this serpent is Satan. And now in Genesis 3.1 we see that Satan is God's creation, but not only that, that he is a beast, more crafty than any other beast of the field. Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever considered that Satan is a beast? There's a Hebrew word that just consists of two letters for the word beast. It's kai and that very word is used in Ezekiel chapter 1 when you have the vision that Ezekiel had of the four living creatures who have the four faces. That word living creatures that describes those beings is kai, beast. So it could have been translated four beasts. And indeed, all of their faces were of beasts, except for the one face that was a human face. Man, created on the sixth day, right? What else was created on the sixth day? All of the beasts of the field. So who is the ruler of this world? To this day, to this very day that I speak, August 19th, 2019, Satan is still the ruler of this world. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. The evil one still rules. We need to be careful it occurs to me that there are many people who believe themselves to be gifted in the spirit and in prayer and so on, who I believe speak very recklessly when they call down the spirits that are in the heavens or when they call Satan names like old Slewfoot or things like that. Do you think Michael would have ever spoken of Satan that way? What did Jude say about people who blasphemed the glorious ones? We need to be very, very careful about the way we pray, and we need to learn to not pray outside of the authority that we have. And I'll give you one example. <clears throat> this occurred either 13 or 14 years ago. 
I was running for judge. I was running for circuit judge. Over an area of five counties, a large geographical area that the current judge that I was running against, I did not think was doing a good job and perhaps had evil influence. And I remember praying a strong prayer, calling down the spiritual forces that were ruling in this area to free it up so that I could run and win as judge. That night, I had a very vivid dream from God. God has given me a few prophetic dreams, not many. I dream all the time. I have constant dreams, seems like, all night. But very few, do I believe, come as a word from God. In this dream, we had a huge, beautiful, great Pyrenees dog. <clears throat> They're strong dogs. Massive, lots of fur. In the dream, this huge bulldog attacked my great Pyrenees and tore its hide off of it, completely stripped it, and killed it. I knew that that was a warning from the Lord about my prayer. And so I recalled that prayer. See, we can, we can pray things, but sometimes we don't have the authority to pray the things that we pray. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you have a word, if you get a word from God, by all means, pray and see it come to pass and watch it come to pass. But too often, too often, we move in our flesh and we do not see the result of our prayer. And sometimes we actually see something that is not good because of something we prayed. So be careful how you pray. Never, ever take Satan lightly. Do not blaspheme him. Do not speak contemptuously of him. Do not think that you have power over him unless God specifically gives you some power. However, Remember the word that I read earlier today from the book of 1 John. Very profound. 1 John 5, 18 says this. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. The evil one does not touch him. So I'm not saying to be afraid of Satan, and I'm not saying to be afraid of demonic manifestations. Let me give you uh, another story, another example. I actually lived in a haunted house for 12 years, and I didn't know it was haunted. I was a Christian. These were the years from 1990 to... 2001, um, a couple of our children who were young at that time told my wife and me about some things that they had seen. I'll give you one example. It's really pretty profound. Uh, my daughter, who would have been about uh, my oldest child, she would have been about nine or ten years old. Mm -hmm. She was in her bedroom that was on the upper level of the house. It was a four-level house, a really interesting house. And she said, she came down and told us that she had seen huge spiders on her wall with human faces. 
and uh, my wife I don't believe I was there my wife was there and answered her and she said are they there now and she said no and my wife said if you see them again rebuke them in the name of Jesus so a few days later they appeared again my daughter 10 years old maybe 11 rebuke them in the name of Jesus these entities that she saw on the wall fixed her with their eyes and began crawling backwards into the closet where they had come from, watching her the whole time and were never seen again. There were a couple other instances. I'll share one more. There was a time we had some uh, a home group over and there was a lady there that was with my wife in the kitchen and she um, the woman told my wife that there was a demon looking at her from beside a cookie jar cookie jar I think looked like a big bear or something so my wife turned around and looked and she said Dina I see a I see our cookie jar, cookie jar there and she said, no, there's a demon there. I see his face. There's a demon there too. And then my wife said, then rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And when she said that, the woman said it left immediately, even though my wife never saw it. After we moved away, and came to the place where I live now, which was now almost 20 years ago, we got a call from the owners of the house who told us some very, very bizarre stories and asked us if the house was haunted when we lived there. Well, I had never considered it to be haunted at all, but then a couple of our children told us a couple other stories and we realized that, in fact, there were manifestations there. But nothing ever manifested to my wife or myself. They could not touch us. They could not touch us. And they knew that if they showed themselves to us, their history. We're going to immediately rebuke them in the name of Jesus and send, send them to waterless places. Turns out the house had previously been, been owned by a witch and a warlock and a witch lived behind the property on some land that was originally part of it so there was a long history of demonic and occult things that had been done there. The bottom line is that we need to understand who the ruler of this world is at this time. And we need to act accordingly and in faith according to our understanding, our revelation, and the Word of God, what God reveals to us and how He leads us. But things are about to change. I'm teaching this today so that you know where we are today and so that you will be able to grasp the things that I am going to be telling you about the incredible changes that are coming. We need to be firmly fixed in the Word of God. We need to understand that the Bible is the Word of God, that it literally was written down as God spoke it through his prophets and they wrote it as they heard it. The book the Bible 
is like a seamless garment. It tells God's story, God's history, over and over from beginning to end. <coughs> we are now coming to the final act. Get ready. Seek the Lord with all your heart and pray and continue to learn his ways. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen.